Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming along this evening. I have to tell you, I'm not really happy I'm here because of an event that happened yesterday. I took the train from Sacramento to San Jose. Like all Englishmen, I love trains and always wanted to be an engine driver rather than a journalist. And when I went up to the ticket office, the guy asked for my ID. We don't have to do this in England, but I'm glad to see you have to produce it in America because there are so many terrorists. Um, and I handed in my passport, and he said something terrible to me. It's never happened before in my life. He said, oh, no, sir, your ticket is $17. You're a senior citizen now. <laughs> I almost offered to pay full fare in order to, you know. I want to talk to you, and I hope we'll be able to talk this evening, and you'll be able to talk to two on the subject that worries me most about the Middle East, and that at the moment is the subject of words and our use of words. I was very struck during the, I noticed we call it a Turkish flotilla. A flotilla, of course, is a naval convoy. The Turkish attempt to break the siege of Gaza, because the semantics of reporting it were very interesting, the way in which the words changed. And I was sitting in Beirut taking a note of um, we have a correspondent in Jerusalem, my paper, a friend of mine, who was covering it on the ground. And I took a note of how the phrases moved. They went like this. Islamic terror, Turkish terror, Hamas terror, Islamic jihad terror, Hezbollah terror, activist terror, war on terror, Palestinian terror, Muslim terror, Iranian terror, Syrian terror, anti-Semitic terror. But I'm doing an injustice to the journalists who reported this and to the Israelis and to your own administration. The lexicon is this. Terror, 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 terror. You're getting it, aren't you? Terror, 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 terror. I have it written down here 60 times, but you know the rest. We are in love with the word. We are seduced by it, fixated by it, attacked by it, assaulted by it, raped by it, and committed to it. It is love and sadism and death in one double vowel word. The opening of every television symphony, the primetime theme song, the headline of every page, a punctuation mark in our journalism, a semicolon, a comma, our most powerful full stop. Terror, 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 terror. Each repetition justifies its predecessor. It is self-perpetuating, each terror giving birth to a new baby terror, in the arms of father terror, a terror attack followed by a terror alert, followed by the prison of terror in which we all, of course, live, and yet further terror. Terror, 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 terror. Most of all, it's about the terror of power and the power of terror. Power and terror have become interchangeable, and we journalists have let this happen. Our language has become not just a debased ally, but a full verbal partner in the language of governments and armies and generals and weapons makers. Remember the bunker buster? Remember the scud buster? The target rich environment? Too obviously silly. If you can't pronounce it, it might not exist. We can't say weapons of mass destruction. WMD. It's a kind of DNA in our writing. It was. It'll come back again soon. It is already with Iran. Power and the media are not just about cozy relationships between journalists and political leaders, between editors and presidents. They are not just about the parasitic osmotic relationship between supposedly honorable reporters and the nexus of power that runs between White House, State Department, Pentagon, Downing Street, um, Ministry of Defense in London, the Foreign Office, and of course America and Israel. In the Western context, power and the media is about words and the use of words. It is about semantics. It's about the employment of phrases and clauses and their origins. And it's, of course, about the misuse of history and about our ignorance of history. More and more today, we journalists have become prisoners of the language of power. Is this because we no longer care about linguistics? Is this because laptops correct our spelling? I have a big problem being a Brit. It's constantly forcing me to write in American English. And I have to keep fighting it and fighting it and fighting it. The Zs, the Os, you know. And for two decades now, the US and British and Israeli and Palestinian leaderships, they've been using the same kind of words, peace process. Do you remember when peace process began? I think it was 1978 at a press conference I attended in Beirut with Cyrus Vance, who would, I think, have been your Secretary of State at the time. 
And you see, even the phrase peace process is a lie because a process is something that proceeds and the, US, and the peace process has never proceeded anywhere. But it, it, you see, we use the words peace process. It's become part of the language, the grammar of television reports, Fox News, CNN, New York Times, and on you go. Poor old Oslo, I often say, to be named after a peace process. And you can see what happens in this process. You see, when it doesn't work, we've got a new cliche. You'll all know it. It is put back on track. Over and over again, the peace process was put back on track until it was, it was a miniature train, a toy train. Of course, I love them. And it was being put on the railway line again. And then in the end, people got bored, so it became a road map. And our own beloved Tony Blair became involved in it. Why God never gave advice to Tony Blair, I have no idea. Like, you know, Tony, this Iraq thing may not be such a good idea, but apparently there was no such advice coming from him, her, it, whatever. But we w then we voted the roadmap. We couldn't put the roadmap back on track, so we talked about issues, which is your word for problems. And then we abandoned it again, and three months ago, CNN, I was listening to it, referred to the peace process being put back on track. You see, we, there is no peace process. It is a total failure. What Oslo introduced was a totally unjust idea whereby all the most important issues, settlements, right of return, Jerusalem, had to be postponed to the very end of the process when, of course, there wasn't enough time to deal with them. And anyone, as the late Edward Said said, who suggested during the process that we do discuss these important issues was told, no, no. You'll make the peace process go off the track if you introduce it now. So the language took us along on this false expedition to, quote, peace, unquote. Look at today in Afghanistan. We're still using, we're regurgitating the same language. Over and over again, I've read, in your newspapers more than ours, we have to win the hearts and minds of the Afghans. Bloody hell, this was a phrase that came from Vietnam. When we were going to win, you were going to win. Fortunately, Harold Wilson kept us away. Mr. Blair would not have done so. You were going to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese, and you lost them, and you lost the bloody war. And now we're using the very same words, partly, I suspect, because the young American officers in Vietnam are now generals in Afghanistan. They know what hearts and minds means. It doesn't mean anything, actually, but it's the phrase, the use of the phrase. Look how we use the word spike. It's come in. It started, I remember, another press conference I had the uh, in, enjoyment of attending in the Green Zone in Baghdad in 2004. It was a man called Brigadier General Kimmet who talked about, we have a spike in violence, right? A spike, I hadn't heard this before, but all the journalists used it. It's only got four letters. It's very easy for a sub-editor to put it in a headline. And what does a spike do? Well, it goes up one side and then it goes down, you see. What he meant, of course, was an increase in violence, a word that's, that, that does not carry the condition or the guarantee of a decrease afterwards, but we use spike. Okay, it's only a spike in violence. Or an uptick. That was a lovely one, uptick in violence. And then we have the surge, which saved us in Iraq, which is why we've only got oh, 50,000 non-combat troops left there, we, who have already been in combat five times since they were non-combat soldiers. The surge, you see, has this unstoppable quality, like a tsunami, a natural tide, unstoppable. You're going to win. Well, what a surge means, and we're now going to have this in Afghanistan, it means reinforcements. And you call for reinforcements when you're losing, not when you're winning. You remember the Battle of Kandahar? We were, we were told in the early spring, we were about to, the surge was coming, we we're going to have a Battle of Kandahar. And it never happened. We had the Battle of Marja, only Marja turns out it didn't really exist. And then in late spring, we were going to have the Battle of Kandahar. In the British press last week, I realized that the Battle of Kandahar is about to begin on September the 20-something. I don't think there's going to be a Battle of Kandahar. I don't believe in it. In fact, I don't believe in any of these wars. I think there's a kind of fantasy, which we use words to keep at, at bay. One of the issues I was discussing with Hatem earlier is, how come in this country, from sea to shining sea, you have this vast treasure trove of knowledge, this font of knowledge about the Middle East. There's hardly a university I go to in the United States which doesn't have a department of Middle East studies, a department of Islamic studies, Hebrew studies, Arabic studies. There's more knowledge about the Middle East in this country than any other country in the West, which we can discuss later. It's another phrase. And yet when I talk to anyone in the State Department or read a State Department document, the best phrase to use is a French phrase, enfantilisme, which doesn't mean childish, it means babishness. 
How come they formulate these crazy policies that have nothing to do with the lands which a vast sea of academic experience understands very well in America and speaks the languages? And then some kind of policy is put together. Oh, we'll have democracy, we'll have some human rights. Yes, let's go and talk to the Arabs about it. And of course, the Arabs have a pretty good idea of their own history. And they sit there saying, what on earth are the Americans talking about? They can talk to you, but they can't talk to the government. There's a problem there, isn't there? Anyway, I'm going to allow Hatton to come in and be abusive, I hope, and you too, and really shout at me. But I, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at the way in which we as journalists have failed you by the way we parrot the language of power back to you. We're always wanting to talk about competing narratives in the Middle East. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, it won't be a secret if I tell you that uh, a long time ago, a British university asked me if I wanted to have some job as a professor of journalism and peace. And I said, what is this all about? He said, well, it's about competing narratives. It's a competition in which no one is occupied and no one does the occupying. It's just two people on a level playing field having an argument. And I realized very quickly what would happen. We'd get a bunch of poor old Israelis here and a bunch of poor old Palestinians here and they'd rage at each other. And my job would be to say, oh, hold on. I think we have some common ground. Look at the other words, you know, we have a fence or a security barrier, the East German phrase for the Berlin Wall, instead of saying the wall, which I was, I was there a few weeks ago. It's higher than the Berlin Wall, longer than the Berlin Wall, but it's a barrier. And instead of occupied territories, it's disputed territories, and so on and so forth. I mean, we can talk on this later. I don't think there's going to be a Palestinian state. I think there will be a one-state solution, and I fear it will be one state only, and it's going to be called Israel. And the Palestinians in Area C, we can talk about Area C, another one, Area C, just part of the Oslo Agreement. Area C is 62% of the West Bank, and it's gone because it's under total Israeli occupation. Settlements are continuing there. And when I went to one Palestinian village, they were not permitted by Israeli law to dig more than three inches into the ground, which is why they had huge concrete blocks to put the power lines in, because they couldn't dig a hole in the ground for the power lines. It's gone. In fact, I think that you know, real figures and real words, I think... Mahmoud Abbas is negotiating, if he is negotiating, for about 10.9% of what was mandate Palestine. Enough is enough. One more question to you before I sit down. At the time of the Gaza siege, indeed at the time of the Turkish convoy, siege breaker, flotilla, call it what you like, what was very interesting was that, you know, there was a very good precedent for what we might have done over Gaza in a different place at a different time. It involved a people who were surrounded and starving. They were surrounded by a fence and a very brutal army. And we, Americans and British, our servicemen risked their lives and sometimes died to save those people whom only three years earlier we had been fighting. We saw them as terrorists three years earlier, but we dropped supplies to them. We flew into their enclave, their ghetto, to feed them and protect them from the brutal army around them. And it was called the Berlin Airlift. Yet not once have I ever seen a report on television, on radio, not even on Al Jazeera, and I dared them to try it, mention that there was a parallel. If we could do the Berlin airlift for the people of Berlin, why couldn't we do a Gaza airlift for the people of Gaza? We all know the reasons. We all, we all know the reasons why not, but our failure to point out that there was a precedent was part of the way in which we have succumbed to the language, the spikes, the surges, the peace process, the dispute rather than the occupation, and so on and so forth. And I have increasingly felt in recent years, and I've been in the Middle East for more than three decades, that that doesn't necessarily mean I know a lot. I, I know less each day, of course. But um, I believe now that, in fact, American policy can't be fixed. I had a US film guy ask me the other day if I'd like to take part in a documentary he wanted to make. It was quite good. It was basically American policy has totally failed in the Middle East. And I said, I agree. And I said, so what are you asking? He said, how to fix it. You can't fix it. My belief is that militarily, not in any other way, but militarily, we must leave the Muslim world. It is not our land. They are not our people. It, we do not own that land. By all means, <laughs> by all means, Send our teachers, send our hydraulic engineers, send our social workers, anything if they're invited, but no more soldiers and M1A1 tanks and swords and horses and Apache helicopters and Bradley fighting armored vehicles. 
Um, and I think that for the same reasons, I also believe, and I had a long conversation again the other day,